This, this lecture was uh, created in, in, to, in some way to bring recognition to the Fishers and Wildlife Sciences program here at NC State and also to bring uh, world-renowned scientists, conservationists into the classroom to interact with, with our students. And uh, I'm sure our uh, guest lecturer can attest that she uh, interacted with quite, with quite a number of students while, she, while she's been here. So the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Program is a, is a program that's actually shared amongst a variety of different colleges on campus, the College of Ag and Life Sciences, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine, and the College of Natural Resources. And I want to thank the support of the College of Natural Resources uh, for helping put this on this year. I also want to thank the graduate students in the Fisheries and Wildlife Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Program because the graduate students helped organize the selection process. They chose the lecture and they actually invited Dr. Turner to come here. And I especially want to shout out to Shiloh Felton. So Shiloh has done a lot to really make this go this year. So thank you, Shiloh. So now I'm going to allow the Dean of the College of Natural Resources to come up and, and say a few words. Dean Watson. Um, and thank you all for, for coming to this event. You know, this event is one I've come to look forward to every year. It's such a pleasure to see Fred Barkelow's daughter, Joanne, and her husband, Donald, who have become good friends of mine. And uh, Joanne is going to come up in a minute and share a few words uh, for you. But I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about how important an endowed lecture series like this is. You know, we couldn't do this without the good support of our, our friends of the College of Natural Resources, and we've invited some of them back to join us uh, this evening. This lecture series brings a premier scientist to campus, and that wonderful person this year, uh, Dr. Turner, in a minute will come up here and you'll see, but. Uh, she gets to interact with our students and, and show them some, some really exciting things that they haven't seen before and to share both her personal story of where she, or how she got to her career, but also the excitement of the discovery of, of being a landscape ecologist, how she works with her students and to encourage our students to think big as they do their work. But my hope is when she goes home, she also says, you know, there are awesome people at NC State doing incredible things that having a lecture series like this is also a way to take our um, great work out to the larger community and let the world know some of the good things that we're doing. So uh, we're hoping to have more and more of these as the years go by. Um, to bring folks uh, to campus who represent the diversity of the, the things the College of Natural Resources is all about. Let me just check my cheat sheets here. The, my, my staff know I'll say whatever I want anyway. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, it's not my intention to hog all the, of Monica's time by prattling on up here, but I just wanted to share for a few minutes how important uh, this kind of lecture series is to our, our college. But it is now my very great pleasure for you to hear uh, from Fred Barclow's daughter, Joanne, a little bit about her passion for wildlife and conservation biology. And uh, I would invite Joanne to come forward and Joanna, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. We had the great pleasure of going out to dinner with Dean Watson. I think it was the second night that you arrived in Raleigh, and what a pleasure. I want to thank each of you, and especially my husband Donald, for spending this afternoon with Dr. Monica Turner, our 2017 speaker for the Barclay Distinguished Conservationist Lecture. I am so grateful for the hard work of Dr. Chris Mormon and the staff and graduate students in the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology program for preparing my parents' lecture and for continuing my father's 1980 vision for this program. When I was thinking about what I would say today, I remembered the very wise words of our extraordinary College of Natural Resources, Dean Mary Watson. 
I was reeling from them, that's putting it mildly, reeling from the results of the 2016 presidential election and worrying about our environment's future. Dean Watson emailed me, quote, we will just have to work harder. So I thought about her words and what my father would do today. And I found my answer in one of the newspaper editorials written after his death. Quote, he had a strong awareness of the cost and benefits of the connection between conservation and conservatism in the sense of safeguarding and reinvesting the riches nature has given us in trust. The editorial continues, a keynote in that career was balance in biology and in politics. Barclow was concerned with balanced multiple uses for for balance, multiple uses for forest, population balance for wildlife, a balance of benefits from conservation, a last major contribution to North Carolina involved political balance of power. When Barclow filed with fellow conservationists the successful 1981 lawsuits over legislative appointments to the commission that helped to commissions that helped halt a growing tilt toward too much legislative clout. The editorial concludes, in and out of the classroom, he lived a committed, engaged life, far from the ivory tower metaphor. He used his academic freedom to make his state a better place to live. So yes, Dean Watson, today, and as my father did before, we just have to work harder to achieve and sustain the balance in biology and the politics that we all value. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks, Dean Watson. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you, Donald, for, for your support. So now I have the pleasure to introduce our Barclay Lecture today. Dr. Monica Turner is the Eugene P. Odom Professor of, the Eco of Ecology and the Vilas Research Professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research emphasizes causes and consequences of spatial heterogeneity in ecological systems, focusing primarily on ecosystem and landscape ecology. You'll hear today about her research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, studying fire, vegetation dynamics, nutri nutrient cycling, and, and the likes. She also studies abrupt change in, eco in ecological systems, land and water interactions in Wisconsin landscapes, and spatial dynamics in ecosystem services. She's published over 250 papers, authored or, authored or edited six books, including the foundation, uh, in, uh, foundation book in landscape ecology. Um, she received her Bachelor's of Science in Biology from Fordham University and her PhD in Ecology from the University of Georgia. So we have, we have that in common, of course. Uh, <laughs> she also is a recent past president of the Ecological Society of America, a recipient of the Society's Robert H. MacArthur Award, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Monica, thanks. like me to come and visit here and thanks to everyone for the hospitality uh, for the past day or two it's really been fun so I'm gonna launch right in by starting and just saying I'm up here speaking today but I'm giving a perspective on many many years of work and I would just like to at the outset uh, acknowledge I have many students and collaborators and funding sources that have contributed to this over the years so national parks are some of our, our highest valued national treasures. These are places where we've preserved unique elements of our landscapes and of our cultural heritage. 
as many of you know, when you go to visit a national park, you're looking for beautiful scenery like Yellowstone Lake or geysers like we have in Yellowstone or the wildlife or all the beautiful things that we see when we enjoy and that we enjoy when we're out there. So when we see scenes like this, this is a little bit different than the way we think about national parks and the way we think about beauty and the way we think about uh, ecological systems. This is Yellowstone during the summer of 1988. Um, these are photos from the uh, famous or infamous, depending on how you think of it, 1988 Yellowstone fires. When those fires ended, this is what the landscape looked like. And these are color photos, they're not black and white. But it looked like everything was gone. So how does this jive with our understanding of national parks and of, of the dynamics that we would expect? So our understanding about natural dynamics in our parks and our wildernesses as much as any other places have, has evolved over time. Um, I think about it from the perspective of the way we think about, uh, about our national parks and the way we think about our ecological systems. And there's just a little timeline here with a couple of the key reports that have, that have talked about the role of parks. So from the Leopold Report in the 60s that said a national park should present a vignette of primitive America kind of a static view that we had a very equilibrium, balance of nature, perspective, and ecology. To, um, the, through the 80s and 90s, as we understood that disturbances were important and that systems change, realizing that we can't conserve our ecosystems in a static way that they have to change. And I would argue, and as I'm thinking, um, you'll see towards the end of my talk today, where we're now thinking about how do we steward these places in, uh, in a time period when we expect continuous change that we don't yet fully understand and don't know how to anticipate. So I would argue that national parks, as places where we can watch nature work and learn from how nature behaves, are also amongst our scientific treasures. And I hope I'll convince you of that, if, you're, if you don't believe me, uh, by the end of my talk today. But they're among our best living laboratories for understanding environmental change with minimal impact of humans. And uh, they've provided new understanding of natural disturbance dynamics, which I'll show you today. And I hope insights into future forest uh, resilience. So I'm going to take you on a trip to Greater Yellowstone for the rest of this afternoon. So we're leaving North Carolina. Uh, Greater Yellowstone is centered on Yellowstone National Park. That's the middle area here. Uh, I don't know if I can reach that kind of way. Surrounded by wilderness areas, national forests, and the like, it's one of the largest intact temperate landscapes in the world, and it's the largest that we have in the lower 48 states. Most of Yellowstone is forested, and the dominant forest types are illustrated here. Uh, the high elevations have spruce and fir forests, that's where it's cooler and moister. Lodgepole pine dominates the middle <coughs> elevations, and that's the dominant tree within Yellowstone National Park. So about 80% of, of Yellowstone is forested, 80% of the forests are lodgepole pine. And then the lower tree line grades into aspens and also Douglas fir, and those are the positions that are lower tree line is warmer and drier in the Rocky Mountains. Now, fire is not new in this landscape, and I have found it kind of fun to read through some of the early accounts of the explorers who were uh, in, um, surveying and, and reporting back on Yellowstone. So there's a fire that's mentioned from one of the, uh, Nathan Langford, he was the first superintendent of Yellowstone from the Washburn Expedition, talking about breaking camp and traveling along the Firebolt River, and passing thence through a long stretch of fallen timber, blackened by fire for about four miles. This, based on the tree ring analyses that my colleague Bill Romney has done, was likely a fire that burned in 1862, so just eight years before they were traveling, and the evidence of that is in their journals. We also know a lot from both dendro studies and paleo studies, where you look at, at, at pores from lakes. And so we now know that infrequent stand replacing, so high severity fires that kill the trees, uh, those kinds of fires are business as usual in Yellowstone and also in many of the northern Rocky Mountain landscapes, including western Montana, where we had a lot of fires this summer. Uh, the fire return interval throughout the Holocene, so since the Ice Age ended over the last 10,000 years, is about every 100 to 300 years. And this fire regime has been limited by climate. And when I, when I say limited by climate, what I mean is that there's pretty much always plenty of fuel. It's not the same as the southeastern longleaf pine systems. But most summers are too wet and too cool for fire to burn. 
So it's only when you get those really extreme conditions that everything can, can take off. And that's actually uh, very consistent with the fires that we see in California this week as well. Those are fire adapted systems burning under Santa Ana winds. So even with that, the 1988 fires were pretty, pretty um, massive. Those of you, I know if there were students here, you might not have been born at the 1988 <laughs> fires. It's kind of a depressing thing when I talk about them these days. Uh, but they were on the news all summer that summer, and everyone thought Yellowstone was destroyed. They've also been referred to as the fires that kind of ushered in this new normal of increased fire throughout the West. And so the size and the severity of those fires surprised both the science and the management community. So this picture in red shows you the outline of the 1988 fires. They, they covered about a third of Yellowstone National Park, and they also went through some of the surrounding areas. They burned under very severe drought, the, the, the um, lowest fuel moisture conditions that had been recorded since they've been tracking it, high winds, 60 mile an hour, very much like what we've heard about on the news for California this week. And they were not caused by past fire suppression. I always try to em emphasize that in this system because that's different from the southwestern forest where you're in ponderosa pine where fire suppression in many places has fundamentally changed fire dynamics. In Yellowstone, that's not the case. Um, but they also gave us an unprecedented opportunity to study the effects of a big disturbance. As a landscape ecologist, this is an opportunity because we don't get to do this experimentally. So this is me in the fall of 1988. I realized I was exactly half the age that I am now, so you can figure that out. I got to fly up in a helicopter during the end of the firefighting season. So this was still with fire suppression money. I've never been in a helicopter before. It was actually kind of fun. But that's what we got to see. And so the fires, even though I showed you those big blocks of red, you know, where you can see it looks like it might have been a moonscape, it's not a moonscape. They're very complex patterns that are created. So this, we, we say it's a mosaic. There's areas where the black in the center, and I'm sorry, I'm only going to point to one side. Anyway, the black in the center is where the fires were most severe, so the trees were killed and the needles are consumed. They're ringed by areas of, red, of brown. That's where the trees were also killed, but the needles and the cones were not consumed by the flames. And then there's lots of areas in green that are unburned, unaffected by the fires. So at this point, we now, this is not a surprise anymore. It was a surprise back in 1988. We didn't know they were going to be this complex spatially. We thought we really did think it was going to be much more of a moonscape um, than it was. And this heterogeneity is important for the revegetation and for many other processes. As we have studied these fires, the vegetation recovered really quickly. And again, faster than we expected. If I go back to the hypotheses in the first NSF proposal that funded this, we were surprised by what we found. Um, when we see, if we see pictures from October of 1988, and then in 1989, this is a little baby lodgepole pine seedling. The tree seedlings come in and they establish the first year right after the fire. The understory vegetation also recovered very quickly. This is two years after the fire. And then by 15 years after the fire, we have a thriving, young, regrowing forest. So that was pretty fast for that system. One of the reasons, one of the mechanisms underpinning this is that even though the fires are big and severe and they kill all the trees, they do not burn deeply into the soil. And we did not know that. I mean, again, I feel like it's kind of staying obvious now that fires blow through pretty quickly. And so many of the roots and the rhizomes survived and then they re-sprouted. So on the top panel, these are some that we excavated, and you can see this lupin is attached to a very old, well-developed root. So in those places that looked black right after the fire came through, there was a lot of re-sprouting native species. They then flowered, set seed, and filled in. So succession was autogenic, that is, it came from the natural species. And we've also tracked invasive species. We expected, based on disturbance and what we see in other places, to see non-natives. That didn't happen. Another surprise, I told the students this morning when I story about this because we misidentified the plant in the first year because it's not supposed to be there. We were all told that uh, aspen had not been produced by seed since the end of the ice age in the northern Rocky Mountains. It's all clonal. And so the first year we had lots of unidentified green things. It was one of them. We thought it was maybe a goldenrod or something like that. And it was woody the next year. And it was aspen and they were reproducing by seed. Again, unexpected based on conventional wisdom. 
We have aspen groves at the lower elevations. This is a little seedling aspen. And then standing right here, this is one of my colleagues. This is an aspen in, I think, 2008, I think it is. So things grow slowly in Yellowstone compared to the Carolinas or the Southeast. So that's, that's not that big for that many years. But nonetheless, they're, they're thriving. And what happened is the fire provided an opportunity for the plants to get around my seed, they established, and they have now moved upslope to higher, cooler elevations than they were distributed within Yellowstone prior to the 1988 fires. So the fires plus the climate warming with the seedling reproduction event gave them a chance to expand. So the logical pine regeneration was very abundant with a lot of variation. We also didn't anticipate that. So these pictures are from 15 years post-fire, and we have everything from, uh, so a hectare is about two and a half acres. I'm sorry, everything's metric, but if you need to convert in your head. Um, we have low densities. This is just natural regeneration. We have medium densities, so over 50,000 trees per hectare, and areas that were up to four and 500,000 little baby trees per hectare. It was ridiculous. I mean, we just never anticipated that. And our study areas span an unknown gradient at that time in serotonin. So lodgepole pine can produce cones that stay on the tree and they remain closed. The seed is safely in there until the cone is heated and then they release their seeds and they reestablish immediately after the fire. So it's an adaptation to fire, but not all logical pines are serotonous. And so this is what happens with lower densities in areas where that trait is less prevalent and very high densities where it's more prevalent. And again, we just didn't know that, we knew they were serotonous, but we didn't know there was that much landscape level variation. The second factor is this mosaic. Any of the places where you see those brown colors those were places where, for a given level of serotony, you also had the cones is still in the canopy, they were heated, and they shed their seeds so locally you get these pulses. So we can now go back in, and I can walk through small dense patches where I know that those were some of these brown halos from 1988. Now, these patterns of tree density are really important from an ecosystem process standpoint because they control uh, things like carbon accumulation, biomass, nitrogen accumulation. So the mosaic of those differences in densities, just the colors here, represent um, different uh, productivity values, above ground productivity of the trees. Point being is that they're, they come in after the fire as a, as a function of serotony and fire severity, and then they kind of set the stage for what's going to happen to that forest for many decades. They persist for over 150 years. This is work from one of my PhD students, Dan Cashin, and it shows on the top panel the average density of trees at different stand ages, so 50 to 100 to over 300. And then here is a measure of the variation, the coefficient of variation among stands. So that just means at the same age, if the bar is high, this, there's lots of differences from one place to another, like low density to high density. And then when it lowers down, they even out. So basically, by the time you're at about 200 years, the density stables at, stabilizes at about 1,200 trees per hectare, and that doesn't vary much along across the landscape. But it means the initial conditions that set up persist for decades to centuries. Nitrogen dynamics. I know that that's a topic that can put many people to sleep. And I'm not going to go into detail on nitrogen, but I just can't resist on some of it. Because most of us, when we've had basic ecology, we, we were taught the Hubbard Brook nitrogen story, which is you cut the trees, and all the nitrogen runs out of the watershed. And they herbicide it as well. They're in very steep terrain, and they're in a high nutrient rich environment. But that's what we were expecting as well. We did not see loss. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to stop there and just say so we have a nitrogen cycle. I'm not going to explain it to you. But following big fires. We didn't know much about what would happen. Most of the work on fire and nitrogen was in prescribed fires like you have in the southeast or low intensity fires like you have in the southwest. And so what we found is that following fire, those systems did not lose nitrogen. And believe me, we tried to find it. I mean, we sampled it, snow melt, and all this kind of stuff. So they were not losing their nitrogen. When we studied in the field, the microbes were using up more nitrogen than they were producing. And basically, the microbial community in the soil 
held on to that nitrogen and didn't let it go. That was a surprise. I actually thought our answers were wrong a few times, so we confirmed it. By 15 years, these growing young trees become, we say, a nitrogen sink. They're taking it up, and they're saving it in their foliage, and now they're competing very well with the microbes, and again, holding on to the nitrogen in that system. These are very poor soils. They're derived from volcanic uh, sediment, apparent material. And so this was also uh, quite su surprising. Excuse me. So some of the nitrogen is volatilized following fire. <clears throat> and I don't want to be like the prime minister in England. She had a disastrous lecture at the continent. <laughs> volatilized. The black bars here are the live nitrogen pools, so what's in the living trees and the biomass. And by 40 to 70 years, whatever was volatilized is, is recovered, and we're still trying to figure out where that comes from. So that was the initial stage. I'll give you a little bit of summary of where the fires, the, the forests were by about 25 years, because we got to resample all of our long-term plots. I didn't expect this to be a long-term study when we started it, but, it, but it has been. And just again, some highlights. For the plant community dynamics, I mentioned that the native species recovered quickly. And we found when we were measuring in our plots, the species richness, the number of species that were present, increased a lot for the first five years at any one place, but then it leveled out. So again, that was a very quick uh, rebound. The composition was um, different early on. But there's a lot of what we, we call an ecological memory. So things that were there previously are still there, and the system kind of recovers in a similar way. Um, without going into too much detail, as we sampled in some of our plots from 1999 to 11 years after fire to 24 years after fire, a large number of plots across the landscape where the lodgepole pine densities varied substantially from those open grown to very dense. We found that even in the very dense ones, species richness of the understory was still increasing. That was opposite to what we expected. We thought there wouldn't be enough light, there wouldn't be enough nutrients, and that they would not have been able to increase, but they were. Early on, it was abiotic conditions that explained what species were where, with a little bit of an effect of burn severity still there. By 2012, however, those lodgepole pines, even though everybody increased, you had more of the pines, you had less species richness. So we see that the trees are starting to exert more control. Um, what the stands looked like after 25 years is are shown in these panels. Again, just to give you a sense, height-wise, these are about two, three meters in height. So again, much slower growing in 25 years than you would expect for your southern pines. But we still have tremendous uh, variation and just robust healthy looking young trees, which we were again surprised to see. They are super productive, like more productive than these young trees should be at this stage. Um, for those of you in the forest ecology side, I did put one number up here. The average AMPP is about five micrograms per hectare per year, but it ranges zero for the trees if we had no trees on the plot, up to over 16, so really high. So if you think about growth rates that happen and the stands are developing, they're sort of hitting the, the steep part of that curve. And at the ecosystem level, it's driven by stem density still. So individual trees in those high density stands are tiny. So tiny in D by DBH. So if you're a forester, it's not what you want. But if you're trying to sequester carbon, it is what you want. Because the more of them you have, even though they're smaller at the ecosystem level, they are still really doing the work. Um, fuels is another really interesting one because there's a lot of discussion about whether or not uh, fires that happen, for how long will that self-limit future fires so when you get fires coming back again. So looking at the fuels development, um, basically I think just look at the main, unless you really like fuels, and I know some of you probably do, um, by the time we're at 25 years, we meet or exceed the fuels that are available in mature forests. So there is plenty of fuel on the ground, and the fuels can support fire. They can 
that can support either high severity surface fire or active ground fire. So either you know fires that are going to kill the trees but creep on the ground, or the ones that go from crown to crown. So these guys, even though we had one to three hundred year fire return intervals, they're good to go. Um, the nitrogen cycling. Again, we did a little bit more. I'm just going to touch on it just a bit. We did a lot of work on the nitrogen in the soils, in the litter, and in the foliage, trying to understand where this, the system is coming from, expecting that we would see evidence for nitrogen limitation given the high growth rates that we're seeing, and we don't. And so looking for it in many different ways, there's no evidence at this point that nitrogen, which is expected to be the limiting nutrient, is limiting the productivity of those large pole pines. Their foliar nitrogen is above the critical threshold indicators from the forestry literature, and actually the productivity of the pines and inorganic and availability are inversely related, which is not the relationship you would expect if the nutrient was limiting. And as we've looked over time, all of the pools of nitrogen have increased in the system. So as the trees have increased in nitrogen, the soil wasn't depleted, like we're not seeing compensation there. So that's a puzzle that we're working on now. So, 1988 fires, consequences, well studied, wonderful opportunity to understand how systems respond to natural disturbances that are big. And even, this was a National Geographic a year ago, we have a good understanding now of succession following these events. We know, you know that the trees will start to come in right after, that we have, we have our animals coming back in, we have a well developed, thriving young forest immediately thereafter. So the bottom line, is that native vegetation and